One of the keys to a successful career in professional wrestling might be longevity, but some wrestlers have managed to have quite the remarkable runs that only lasted a few years. Indeed, there is nothing to say that you can't win titles, perform on pay-per-views, make history, and make money in a limited window of time. These lot proved it, even if in many cases their runs were ended due to factors outside of their control or in tragic circumstances. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 short but spectacular pro wrestling careers. Join us! Number 10. Blitzkrieg I'm not one to believe in time travel, unless it's a bank holiday weekend and I happen to be watching the Back to the Future trilogy, but former WCW star Blitzkrieg has me thinking it might be possible. The high-flying masked man showed up as if from nowhere in early 1999, dazzled everyone with his revolutionary offense, and then disappeared less than a year after making his TV debut. In that short time, Blitzkrieg, who had been wrestling on the indie since 1994, got to work with some true legends, including Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero, and positively stole the show in a barn burner with Juventud Guerrero at Spring Stampede. The man under the hood, Jay Ross, seemingly grew tired of the bumps and bruises and grind of the road, and after reportedly suffering a nasty concussion, decided to quit the business. The 1999 Wrestling Observer Rookie of the Year never wrestled again, choosing instead to become a computer technician before changing careers and becoming a registered nurse. He made one post-retirement wrestling-related appearance to publicly pass his gimmick to Jack Evans, a man he had inspired to become a wrestler. Number 9. Droz Darren Drozdov was a promising American football player whose skill on the gridiron saw him make it all the way to the NFL. His football career was ended due to injury, but the former nose tackle for the Denver Broncos attracted interest from the world of sports entertainment due in part to his athletic ability and in part due to his ability to regurgitate on cue. The man first known as Puke and then simply Droz had a brief spell in ECW before debuting on WWE television. Droz was lucky in that he showed up right as WWE were at their hottest. He got to participate in the infamous Brawl for All tournament, team up with the Legion of Doom, and then form a promising duo with Prince Albert. Of course, Droz was unlucky in that his career was cut short and his life changed forever when he suffered a severe neck injury at the October 5th, 1999 SmackDown and Heat tapings. Paralyzed upon impact, the 30-year-old has had to use a wheelchair ever since. Considering he was only around for really 18 or so months, Droz managed to pack a lot into such a short amount of time. Number 8. Tom McGee Few wrestlers have been so intrinsically linked to one match as Tom McGee. The former powerlifter and bodybuilder, and runner-up in the 1982 World's Strongest Man competition, will forever be tied to the mythical October 7th, 1986 non-televised dark match he had with Bret Hart, which remained unseen for decades until it was dug up and broadcast, complete with accompanying documentary, on the WWE Network in 2019. The story goes that the Hitman did such a good job of making the massively muscular and surprisingly agile McGee look better than he really was that Vince McMahon was convinced that he had just unearthed the next Hulk Hogan-like megastar. The illusion unfortunately fell apart when Mega Man was in the ring with other opponents, however, and his career never really took off. But McGee, for all his technical faults, did have a five-year career in the business that, aside from the Bret Hart match, yielded a few highlights. He worked for trainer Stu Hart's Stampede Wrestling promotion, as well as overseas for All Japan, before quitting the business in 1990. Number 7. Sean O'Hare Size, strength, frightening agility, and a million-dollar look Of all the graduates from the WCW Power Plant training facility, Sean O'Hare had the most upside. Debuting on television in the summer of 2000, O'Hare, along with tag partner Mark Jindrak, was one of the few bright spots in the dying days of the company. The natural-born thrillers won the WCW tag team titles, and O'Hare in particular looked like a future main eventer. He would have to wait for his opportunity after WCW was bought by WWE, but in early 2003, he re-emerged with a new and intriguing Devil's Advocate gimmick. Paired with Roddy Piper, O'Hare got a decent push initially, which included a rare victory over Mr. America, who I think was Hulk Hogan under a mask? 
Regrettably, things went a bit wobbly after that due to backstage issues, a motorcycle accident, and other outside the ring incidents, and O'Hare was released in early 2004. Subsequently turning his attention to MMA, the Year 2000 Wrestling Observer Rookie of the Year did manage to squeeze in a couple more post-WWE matches, including a Tokyo Dome showdown with Hiroshi Tanahashi. Number 6. Monty Brown Monty Brown was a feared American football player who turned out for the Buffalo Bills at the Super Bowl before an ankle injury forced him to change vocations. With his size, look, and charisma, professional wrestling was a natural fit for him, and he made his debut in 2001. An obvious prospect, he was still undeniably a little rough around the edges and only wrestled a handful of matches in those early years. The alpha male's big break came in 2004 when he returned to TNA and got over in a major way, sending him rapidly up the card. Unfortunately, he was unable to unseat NWA champion Jeff Jarrett, but Brown was always in the mix and got to work with some top stars in major programs. After his TNA deal expired, he was picked up by WWE and placed on ECW. He may have been one of the faces of that brand had he not suddenly had to leave the company and retire from wrestling in order to look after a family member. Really only on the wrestling world's radar for a few years, Monty is one of the industry's great what-ifs. That said, his accomplishments and impact, pardon the pun, should not be overlooked. Number 5. Sable WWE went to great lengths to bag Mark Mero, signing him to a then-rare guaranteed contract due to Vince McMahon believing that the former Johnny B. Bad could be a headliner. However, it was Mark's wife, Rena, who accompanied him to his WWE job interview and was duly signed after she had wiped Vince's saliva off her that became the bigger superstar. Debuting initially as the valet of Hunter Hearst Helmsley, it didn't take long for the blonde beauty to capture the hearts and, um, minds of the Attitude Faithful. Sable was a sex pot pinup, the likes of which WWE had never really seen before, and the company exploited it for all it was worth for a couple of years. And the ratings spoke for themselves. They said that male 18 to 34 demographic really likes Sable. The former women's champion then shockingly left the company in the spring of 1999 and sued them for, amongst other things, sexual harassment. That didn't totally burn Sable's bridge, however, and after four years of trying to forge an acting career and flirting with other wrestling endeavors, she was brought in for another run before leaving again to start a Viking family with new boo Brock Lesnar. Number 4. Magnum TA if you were to create the perfect babyface for the 1980s, particularly one focused on the southern market, you would end up creating Magnum TA by default. With his Tom Selleck moustache, jacked physique, and badass demeanor, he was the sort of guy women in the audience fawned over and guys in the audience wanted to have a beer with, and vice versa in some cases too, I'm sure. Having caught fire while working for Jim Crockett Promotions, thanks to booking that protected his relative inexperience, a tag team with the ever-popular Dusty Rhodes, and a gripping blood feud with the despised Tully Blanchard, Magnum was well on his way to the NWA heavyweight title. In fact, with the American Dream booking the territory and Magnum Magnum being a proven draw, he likely would have captured it in either late 1986 or early 87. However, fate intervened, and just a few weeks out from Starcade 86, Terry Allen crashed his car in an accident that almost cost him his life. It didn't, thankfully, but it did end a career that was only going to get better and better. Number 3. Nick Mondo The name Sick Nick Mondo might not be familiar to many, but to fans of ultra-violent deathmatch wrestling in the early 2000s, he was a true superstar. Mondo debuted for Upstart Combat Zone Wrestling in 2000 and quickly made a name for himself thanks to the extreme punishments he was willing to endure for his art. Tables, ladders, chairs, glass, barbed wire, weed whackers, nothing was off limits in a Sick Nick Mondo match, and he became a cult hero in the Philadelphia based promotion, winning the CZW Iron Man title, tag team titles, and the second ever Tournament of Death. Even those that didn't necessarily watch CZW knew of Mondo due to the gory photos of him that would be published in the wrestling magazines. Of course, pro wrestling ain't ballet, and deathmatch wrestling is more like bullfighting, only the bull is covered in spikes and you're tied to a pole wearing a bright red suit. Naturally, Mondo accrued several major injuries during his fleeting career, which forced him to hang up his light tubes just four years into it at the age of 23. He's maintained a slight connection to the business as a filmmaker and was the man behind John Moxley's post-WWE vignettes and hype videos. Number 2. Hannah Kimura 
The daughter of professional wrestler and mixed martial artist Kyoko Kimura, Hana Kimura decided to follow in her mother's footsteps and started training with Japan's Wrestle 1 promotion in the mid-2010s. It wasn't long before her services were in demand in her homeland, where she split her time between Wrestle 1, Sendai Girls, and Stardom, as well as overseas for Ring of Honor, Pro Wrestling Eve, and in Mexico. It was for Stardom, however, where Hannah really excelled and became a true star, capturing the organization's Artist of Stardom and Goddess of Stardom championships, as well as winning 2019's five-star Grand Prix tournament. Clearly a name on the rise and possessing boundless energy, enthusiasm, and charisma, Hana Kimura looked destined to become one of the biggest female stars in the business. That was obvious when she was chosen to represent stardom and help kick off New Japan's Wrestle Kingdom event in front of a packed Tokyo Dome on January 4th, 2020. Tragically, Hannah would take her own life less than six months after, being the recipient of online bullying and harassment due to her involvement in a reality TV show. She was only 22. Number 1. Mohamed Hassan Young Italian-American Mark Capani got his big break after a couple of years performing in WWE's developmental system, OVW. He wasn't being called up as the newest member of the FBI, however. On the contrary, the 24-year-old was brought to Raw as disgruntled Arab-American Mohamed Hassan. It was, from the off, a controversial button-pushing character that generated intense heat and ensured that Hassan was always involved in a major storyline. I mean, in just eight months, he got to work with Hulk Hogan, Shawn Michaels, Chris Jericho, Steve Austin, The Undertaker, John Cena, Batista, and more. Rumor has it that WWE may have gone all the way with the lightning rod and made him world heavyweight champion had the UPN network not demanded his removal from SmackDown following a regrettable terroristic angle that aired on July 7th, 2005, the same day as the London bombings. Released just a couple of months later and quickly announcing his retirement thereafter, Capani has since enjoyed a second career as a junior high school principal, only coming back for three independent show matches in 2018. His WWE run remains one of the most curious in pro wrestling history.